Up next, we're excited to have Dr. Kunle Odunsi present on ovarian cancer and immunotherapy. Dr. Odunsi is the director of the University of Chicago Medicine Comprehensive Cancer Center and serves as the Biological Sciences Division Dean for Oncology. He's a nationally recognized expert in immunotherapy and has made significant research contributions in developing immunotherapy vaccines for ovarian cancer patients. He's also an associate director of CRI's Scientific Advisory Council. Let's learn from Dr. Odunsi. My name is Kunle Odunsi. I am the director of the University of Chicago Medicine Comprehensive Cancer Center, and I am a gynecologic oncologist, and my special area of focus is in um, tumor immunology and immunotherapy. First, I would like to thank the CRI for organizing this program. This is a very important program that I think really will allow us to um, speak to our patients and their families regarding some of the current, not only the current state, but potential future directions in ovarian cancer immunotherapy. Ovarian cancer is a major public health challenge. Right now, all, almost 20,000 people will be diagnosed each year in the United States, and more than 12,000 deaths occur in the United States each year from this disease. We have done incredibly well over the last 30 years with newer drugs, newer agents. Um, I remember when platinum-based chemotherapies came into being. They were revolutionary at the time. And all of the efforts of the past 30 or more years have led to improved overall survival, which now stands at about 49% for all patients with ovarian cancer. But let me point out right from the get-go that there are many types of ovarian cancer. It is not just one disease. Um, there, are, there are subtypes. The most common type is what is called the high-grade serous ovarian cancers. And most of the, um, most of the um, discussion that we're gonna have today will focus on this group, but many points are applicable to other types of ovarian cancers, such as uh, what are called clear cell cancers or endometroid carcinomas. So again, there are many types, but the major focus is on the most common type, which is high-grade um, cancers. So why do we think immunotherapy could be effective in ovarian cancer? Studies by our group and the group of George Kukos and others over the years show that when ovarian cancers are infiltrated by immune cells called T cells, those patients with high abundance of those T cells tend to do better, suggesting that the immune system can recognize and potentially destroy ovarian cancers. Then the next question becomes, how do we turn this information for patient benefit? When the immune checkpoint inhibitors these are drugs like Ketruda and others. When this came into, into, into being um, a few years ago, um, there was, they, they were greeted with much enthusiasm because what these drugs do is that they're able to resurrect the immune cells that are within the tumor microenvironment. Because these immune cells, the T cells are present in the tumor, but they are not able to act. So how do, you, how do you resurrect them? How do you make them to attack and destroy tumor targets? The immune check inhibitors have been revolutionary in um, ab the ability to be able to do this and increase the ability of T cells to destroy tumor targets. There are spectacular results from many cancer types showing their efficacy, such as in breast, in liver cancers, in um, um, bladder cancers, melanomas, a lot of cancer types have demonstrated remarkable success with the use of these immune checkpoint inhibitors. But in ovarian cancers, the results have been rather disappointing. For example, 
when you look at the use of single agent immune checkpoint inhibitors, studies focusing on drugs like pembrolizumab or nivolumab or atezolizumab, avelumab, these are all groups of immune checkpoint inhibitors that target the PD1, PDL1 axis. So there's there's these are the immune checkpoints that are mostly responsible for not allowing the immune system to work. When you consider all these drugs that I mentioned, the response rates in ovarian cancers are very low, about eight to sometimes up to 20%. And then those responses are not long lasting. They are very short lived responses. So the next question is, why not combine two types of immune checkpoints, just like we do for chemotherapies? And so what we've done, what some groups have done is to combine um, a drug that is blocking PDL1 um, or PD1. This is a drug like nivolumab, and combined with another drug that blocks another immune, another type of immune checkpoint that is called EP, epilimumab. Again, the response rate when you combine both increased tremendously. In fact, up to 31% response rates in those studies. But again, if you look at the duration of response, they were very limited, less than four months. So what do we do? How can we improve the efficacy, effectiveness of immune checkpoint inhibitors in ovarian cancer so that we achieve results that are similar to other types of cancers, such as, again, melanomas, breast cancers, or, or um, non-small cell lung cancer. So one strategy is to combine with chemotherapies. So what if we combine with chemotherapy? And again, there were studies that have been done where in patients with relapsed disease, does the question is, does the addition of chemotherapy, such as doxyl, liposoma doxorubicin, which is a common drug that is used for recurrent ovarian cancer, do we see increased benefits? The answer to this in a very large randomized study was that, in fact, there was no increased benefit of, of adding immunotherapy. Then maybe we were using it too late, maybe because these patients already have relapse. Can we bring it to the frontline setting? And again, studies where you combine immunotherapy with chemotherapy and even use the immunotherapy as maintenance. In other words, patients who respond and you continue for additional several months, do we see increased benefit? Again, unfortunately, the results were negative. So the question is, what do we do? Are we just going to throw up our arms? The answer to that, of course, is no. A number of groups around the world are working very hard and um, to, to, number one, ask the question, are there a subset of patients that potentially can benefit? And number two, are there other modalities of immunotherapy that we can potentially deploy for ovarian cancer patients? So let me start by addressing the first question. Are there a subset of patients that potentially can benefit? One aspect that has emerged in ovarian cancer therapy over the last several years is the need for molecular testing of the tumors. Every patient who is diagnosed with ovarian cancer should undergo genetic testing, both germline testing, to see whether there are mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2 or any of the other BRCA-related genes. Additional testing should be what is called somatic mutation testing. That is test, taking the tumor specimen itself and testing to ask questions regarding whether there is BRCA1, BRCA2 related genes or something called HRD deficiency, homologous recombination um, pathway deficiency. So these are all critical because not only do they have implications for standard therapies, such as the use of PAP inhibitors, 
they also potentially have implications for the use of immunotherapy. And let me highlight that um, by talking about FDA approvals. These are FDA approvals for immunotherapies in patients whose tumors have um, high tumor mutation burden. So patients whose ovarian tumors have high mutation burdens are potentially eligible to be treated to benefit from immunotherapy, immune checkpoint inhibitors, um, again, the blocking of PD-1 and PDL one The second group that can benefit based on molecular testing are patients whose tumors demonstrate what is called MSI high, microsatellite instability high tumors, or where there's deficiency in DNA mismatch repair genes. So there's a subset of patients that potentially could benefit, but they can be identified via molecular testing of the tumor, as well as germline testing to see whether they have mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2. So the next question is, so what are the next um, opportunities to improve immunotherapy in ovarian cancer? Well, I, I already talked about BRC1, BRCA2, and HRD. There are studies that have tried to combine the PAP inhibitors, which have shown tremendous ability or, or benefit in ovarian cancer patients that harbor mutations in BRCA or evidence of HRD deficiency. So combination of a PAP inhibitor with and immunotherapy has been tried in a, in a number of trials, and those results appear to be promising in a subset of, of patients with specific features. So that requires additional exploration, and in fact, additional trials are ongoing where the combination of a PAP inhibitor with bevacizumab, which is again, part of standard care for some ovarian cancer patients, PAP inhibitor, bevacizumab, along with a, an immune checkpoint inhibitor. All of those trials, again, are, are ongoing. Some of the initial results appear to be, um, to be promising. But let me begin to talk about some of the future strategies that we think could really transform immunotherapy for ovarian cancer. One strategy is adoptive cellular immunotherapy. And I'm sure many have heard about CAR T cells that have been very effective for some liquid tumors. Um, some lymphomas and leukemias have benefited tremendously from the use of CAR T cells. Can we generate T cells for patients um, with ovarian cancer? There are many studies ongoing now, um, either using CAR T cells or using what are called TCR engineered T cells. These are different types of immune cells where you can generate millions or sometimes billions of these cells and give them back to patients, almost like you are giving a blood transfusion. These are immune cells that are specifically programmed to attack the tumor. So there are ongoing studies that have shown promise. In fact, there was one recent study um, in this past year that targeted um, a, a molecule expressed on ovarian cancer that is called MAGE A4. And again, preliminary evidence that this type of approach could be beneficial in ovarian cancer was shown um, in this study. Then the second major area of development is the use of um, a, a special type of virus that are called, um, th these types of virus are called oncolytic viruses. Oncolytic simply meaning they can destroy tumors themselves. So these viruses are typically specific for the tumor, for the ovarian cancer. You can imagine if you drop these viruses within the abdominal cavity where ovarian cancer exists, they can directly destroy the cancer cells. 
they spare normal tissue, but in the process of destroying the cancer cells, they, and they, 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 they um, initiate an immune response also against the cancer. So what has become very clear over the last few years is that you can actually use these viruses to even deliver payloads directly into the tumor. So you tag on additional um, um, chemicals or, or compounds onto the viruses so that as they are destroying the cancer cells within the abdominal cavity of ovarian cancer patients, they are also releasing um, um, chemicals or substances that can further destroy the tumor or, or enhance immune responses um, against the tumor targets. Those are two major directions um, that are new opportunities that potentially could be combined with immune checkpoint inhibitors or with standard chemotherapies or with bevacizumab in order to improve the benefits of immunotherapy for ovarian cancer patients. I think we have made tremendous progress. We now have a better understanding of um, some of the things that we need to do to improve the, um, the benefits of, of immunotherapy in ovarian cancer patients. And the next few years, I think, will be um, very key in demonstrating some of the benefits of the principles that we have learned um, over the last 10, 15 to 20 years.